Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Open Access Platforms, Empowering Transparent and Efficient Publishing Workflows, which is sponsored by Elsevier. Uh, this session is one in a series of sponsored webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Um, and also just put some links in the chat for where you can register for upcoming webinars or watch previous uh, webinar recordings. Okay, uh, before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. So all of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off. So don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. To adjust the size of the slides or video, you can use the divider in the middle of the screen to slide the sizes to your liking. Uh, we are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speakers. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your questions and comments into the Q&A module as they occur to you. Uh, you can also use the upvote feature to highlight questions you'd like or would like to be addressed. Also, there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle, to toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version and where to access today's slides. And with that, we are ready to get started. So I will hand it over to our moderator for today, Emily. Great. Thank you so much, Sabrina, and welcome, everyone. My name is Emily Singley, and I'm the Vice President of North American Library Relations at Elsevier. And I'm so delighted to be here today with two of our Open Access Agreement partners, as well as two of my Elsevier colleagues to share information with you about our open access platforms. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to just take a few minutes to have some introductions on who we are, and we will also have a couple of audience poll questions for you. Um, and then we'll give a short background on open access agreements at Elsevier. And then we're going to have a discussion with our two um, open access agreement partners from Tulane University and the University of Kansas about their experiences um, implementing an open access agreement. And um, then we'll be taking a look at the actual open access workflows from both the author and the library sides, showing the kinds of choices authors need to make as they submit papers and what libraries see when they approve those authors. And we're going to be saving plenty of time at the end for audience Q&A. So as Sabrina mentioned, please do go ahead and use the Q&A functionality to ask questions as you think of them throughout the presentation. So a few brief introductions. I've already introduced myself. So um, why don't we uh, pass it off here to Andy to introduce yourself? And I think you're on mute, Andy. Of course. <laughs> I'm Andy Corrigan. I'm Associate Dean of Libraries uh, at Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. Great. And Barack. Hello, everyone. This is Bharat Aradila. I'm the Senior Business Development Manager for Open Access at Elsevier, based in Amsterdam, Netherlands. Great. And Kristen? Hi, I'm Kristen Cedarstrom. I'm the Electronic Resources Librarian at the University of Kansas Medical Center, which is located in Kansas City, Kansas. And our main campus is located in Lawrence, Kansas. Great. And Matt? Hello everyone, I'm Matt Cumberledge. I'm Principal Product Manager at Elsevier and I look after the development of our open access workflows. And I'm in Oxford. Wonderful, great, great global panel we have today. That's great, uh, thank you all. Um, and now it's actually your turn. So to the audience, we have three poll questions for you. So just take a couple of minutes here to, um, to let us know a little bit about you and about why you decided to join us today. Um, first question is really just, what is your role in the library? Um, and then uh, what's your, what's your uh, level of expertise on these sorts of open access workflows and agreements? Um, 
And then the last question is just, have you already um, set up one of these agreements with a publisher, whether with Elsevier or with anyone else? Um, and, and uh, you know, just how many folks are already doing this kind of thing and how many maybe haven't, haven't yet. Um, so we'll just take a couple of, couple of seconds here to give everybody a chance to tell us a little bit about themselves and then we'll see the results. All right. So poll question number one. Wow, we have a really diverse audience today. This is fantastic. Um, so a lot of people from a lot of different areas. There's not really one that stands out. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and, and a lot of others. So there's a lot of other types of people out there um, who might be on this call. So that's great. Uh, let's see. Um, level of expertise. Oh, good. We don't have too many experts. That's nice. <laughs> that means that everybody hopefully is here to learn. And, and that's great. Um, I'm not an expert myself. That's why I moderate. So I don't need to be an expert. That's fantastic. Uh, hoping to learn more, a lot of unfamiliars. That's great. Uh, do you have at least one OA agreement with a publisher? Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, a, a kind of a mixed, um, batch here too. So some, a lot of yeses, a lot of noes, um, and some not sure. So that's great too. Uh, excellent. Thank you for taking the time to answer those questions. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's always good to kind of know who we're speaking to. Um, all right. So um, I'm just going to uh, briefly give a little bit of background on open access agreements before we kind of uh, get to the main part of the presentation. Um, so uh, Elsevier is one of the fastest growing open access publishers, and nearly all of our uh, journals now do support OA publishing. And in addition to those hybrid journals, we, uh, where authors have that choice of publishing either OA or subscription, we also now have 760 fully open access journals. And globally, we support that with over 2,000 institutions who have OA agreements um, uh, around the world. So quite a few institutions are covered already. Um, and two of our newest open access agreements, um, both signed just this year, are with Tulane University and the University of Kansas, which is why it's so wonderful to have both Andy and Kristen with us today. Um, those two agreements, uh, there's a page about each of them up on our OA agreements uh, site on uh, the Elsevier site, but you can also just Google Elsevier and Tulane University or University of Kansas, and you'll see the information on their websites as well if you want to learn more. So for authors at both of these uh, institutions, they now do have the choice when publishing with Elsevier to have the APC cost covered by the library's agreement. And a bit later in this session, we're going to take a look at what that actually looks like for authors and for libraries. Um, all right. So now uh, I'm going to just invite Andy and Kristen to share more about their experience implementing these agreements. Um, and so since we don't have slides, we're just going to kind of turn off the slides for this section um, so we can see our faces. So hi, Andy. Hi, Kristen. Hello. Hi. Great to have you here. Um, so Andy, let's let's kick it off with you. Um, why why did uh, Tulane decide to pursue an open access agreement this year with with Elsevier? Well, actually, we we started talking to Elsevier about this um, quite a while ago. It was before the COVID pandemic, so let's say you know at least four years ago. So, you know, what we were really talking about was cost of subscriptions and our ability to sustain that cost. And I think what is striking about this for us is that at, at, even at that point, this was quite a while ago, we just, the Elsevier reps who we were talking to, we started to see some interest on the publisher and in talking about the same thing, I think they understood that um, that we were <laughs> that we were having a really hard time sustaining the cost of these things. So, so that's what really what 
made us, you know, start talking about this and where op open access came in at the same time, we were beginning to see uh, a number of publishers, but um, particularly Elsevier talking with uh, mostly consortia about open access agreements. And we were following this discussion with University of California system, but geographically Tulane, we're a pretty large library, but we're kind of, you know, sort of at the edge of most consortia. So we, we felt we had this uh, challenge of the cost, but also um, not a lot of leverage um, on our own, but we figured what the heck, let's, you know, keep the discussion going and see where this um, might lead. And we were thinking about open access as a possibility of sort of coming off of this discussion of, of costs and sustainability, it, the discussion turned with open access to return on investment. So if you could, uh, if you could stabilize costs and show that your subscriptions had a greater return on investment for your institution, then, then you were really getting somewhere. And I think this resonated with our, our sales folks too. And you know, of course they had to sell <laughs> this idea within their, um, you know, to, to the higher ups at, at Elsevier, but it took a while, it took, it took a long time, I think coming out of COVID, obviously things changed on the Elsevier end. And, and we were able to, to work something out that I think address, you know, you know, have begun to address a lot of these concerns. So that's, that's what we were up to. That's great. That's great. Um, so, so Kristen, um, next question over to you. Um, uh, similarly, you know, what, what did this look like at the University of Kansas as you started to implement this agreement? What, what did that look like for you at the beginning? What did you need to do to get this, this agreement off the ground? So we started our communications with Elsevier very early in 2022. Um, our contract was expiring December of that year. And so we knew that we wanted an open access accommodation, and we knew that we didn't know exactly what that was going to look like because um, so many of these read and publish models are being piloted and just kind of tested to see what works and what doesn't. Um, so we wanted to communicate very clearly what it is we were looking for in a read and publish agreement. Um, much like Andy had mentioned, we needed sustainable and predictable costs along with um, the OA portion. So uh, Ultimately, it was just a kind of a lot of back and forth discussion with Elsevier to reach the um, agreement that we have, uh, which is, you know, priced within our budget. Most of the journals are eligible. There are only a few excluded, such as Cell Press and Lancet, some society journals. Um, we were really confident our, our agreement has article caps, so we were very confident that the caps that we negotiated would cover all of our authors who wanted to publish in hybrid OA. We really wanted an accommodation for publishing in fully open access journals, and we had wanted that to be included with our article caps. Um, ultimately, we were not able to agree to that, but we did agree to a small discount on publishing in, in fully OA journals. Um, so by the end of October, we had finalized our negotiations with Elsevier um, on the terms, but then we still had the license agreement to complete. And normally in a read-only agreement, we're able to um, extend our access uh, sometimes by months while we finalize that um, license negotiation. But in this agreement, because there's a published side to it, we weren't able to do that. We we had a pretty um, uh, 
rigid deadline of early January so that our authors could start taking advantage of uh, publishing under our agreement. So um, we managed to do that. We expedited the license agreement. Our dashboard went live on January 6th. We immediately received a, a request for funding. Um, Elsevier posted information about our agreement to their website so everyone could, we had something to point to. We took part in a training demo to familiarize ourselves with the dashboard and how to use it, what our authors will see. Um, so yeah, overall it was, um, I think the negotiation process was the most uh, difficult and time consuming as they always are. Um, but the actual implementation of uh, the dashboard itself um, was very, very easy. And and Andy, similar to you, like when when you got to that, getting it set up and and you know kind of getting that platform uh, set up on your campus. How did that go for you? Um, actually, pretty smoothly. Um, you know, for us, you know, our we didn't want a lot of restrictions on the on the agreement from the author side. We wanted it to be as, really as seamless as possible. And I've, you know, the lot of libraries or library systems have, have approached this in different ways. I, I, I think there's a group that would like to make sure that somehow the, that authors contribute at least a little bit and that, um, you know, has some advantage for their, um, some perceived advantage, but for us, no, we, <laughs> we just want to keep it, keep it easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To keep it simple, get it out there. Our, our only real interest is in confirming the eligibility of, of the author. Are they indeed a, a Tulane affiliate? And, and so th that's our primary interest in this. We really want to just get this out there to as many people who are using the subscriptions as as possible. And that seems to have worked pretty well. It, it's it's relatively easy to follow. I, I can say that, you know, in, in in setting this up, it was important to find the right model for this, you know, in discussing mm -hmm. this with Elsevier. And, you know, there there are there's the read and publish, the publish and read, you know, the ones where that you pay extra upfront for this. And then there are the ones where the cost is more built into the subscription. And then there's the limits on the number of article waivers and so on. And I think Elsevier for us at, at the end, when we fin finalized our deal, we had elements of a lot of these different models, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's it's one of we have a number of these agreements now, and this this is one of our better ones, I think. That's great to hear. Yeah, it's great that you had that flexibility to be able to sort of put something together that worked for for you. Um, so so also yet yeah, for you, Kristen. So Andy, you mentioned someone at the library has to approve um, the the author, right? Are they affiliated? Are they actually a Tulane person? Um, what does that look like on your campuses, Kristen, in terms of who who in the library does that approval and how do they do it? Yeah, so um, we, even though we're a single university, the University of Kansas, we uh, have our main campus in Lawrence and our medical campus in Kansas City. And uh, each campus uh, has different systems for verifying our author's affiliation. So it was really important to us to have representation um, at libraries on both campuses to be able to review what our authors are um, submitting and approving uh, those requests. So um, Elsevier was able to set up separate logins for each campus. Uh, so we can each log into the dashboard and approve our own authors. I uh, review and approve the authors at the medical campus and uh, the e-resources service specialist over at the main campus reviews and approves their authors. We can see each other's in the dashboard. So we can see the whole combined, but we both have access and that's been really essential to our workflow. Yeah, and I imagine at a medical campus, 
you have a lot of you have more complexity in terms of who's affiliated and who's not, right? So it's important that the medical campus librarian be able to do that, you know, instead of having to rely on the um, Lawrence campus, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and essentially, you know, and anyone who is eligible has a kumc.edu email, okay. and that's that's how we're able to verify. Um, but we do have, you know, in addition to faculty, staff, and students, we have we have residents, we have um, fellows. So we have a lot of different um, varieties of eligible corresponding authors. Did you have any of that kind of complexity at Tulane, Andy, or what is it, does it all um, go through one library or how does that it work It all for goes you? through one library. Um, I, I think at, at the end of the day, you know, some of this is mitigated just by, you know, who who is likely on your campus or campuses to submit articles to Elsevier journals for publication. And, and that, That's true. That, that filter has a tendency to filter out of quite a number of problems. So so in that sense, it's it's worked pretty smoothly for us. I think with it, having a number of agreements, the publishers do seem to have their different dashboards for monitoring this. And you know, I think this might become a challenge for us as we add more agreements, but but so far so good. It, it's worked pretty well. Just the the one thing that's given us problems, uh, not with this publisher, but with another is the cap. You know, setting that cap on the number of um, articles that would be uh, where the fees would be waived um, per year. If you get, if that is too low <laughs> going right. into the agreement it we've discovered that it, that is that's hard to repair um in midstream so it's important to get that right yeah get that try and get that number right exactly and i imagine you hear about that from from your faculty so yeah that kind of leads me to to my next question um in terms of your communication and outreach to faculty and students about this agreement, um, what has what was your approach there, and what kind of um, outreach did your libraries do to communicate this to your to your authors? Uh, oh, let's start with uh, sorry. <laughs> let's start with Kristen. Sure. So um, we wanted to make sure that you know everyone who. Uh, would be eligible to participate in publishing under this agreement would know about it. So we worked with the Office of Communications and Advancement at the main campus to help us draft campus-wide announcements. So we sent uh, news announcements that targeted faculty, that targeted um the whole campus. So it went out in our daily news alerts that went to both campuses. Uh, we posted um, on our respective websites as well as on our open access initiatives page. I'll just plunk um, meds here in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. At MED, we made an announcement to uh, our intranet news that goes campus wide, as well as announcing to our research administration newsletter. And we each campus talked about it in our annual report. So between the mm -hmm. two campuses, we really just tried to get as much out there as possible in a variety of different methods, because, you know, as we know, not everyone reads email, um, right. given the volume of email I'm sure that we all get. Um, so a variety of channels was really helpful in marketing this. And how about how about at Tulane, Andy? Did you have any issues we, communicating this out or um, we, how did we, you approach that? We had a similar approach to, to what Kristen was uh, describing. But I'll add that one of the things that we were surprised by here was the the yeah the demand that was already there. Mm -hmm. um, so that when um, we rolled these out, we were very worried. You know, <laughs> since the publishers are on a typically on a calendar year and we're on an academic year, fiscal year, it's, it's just those timing doesn't always 
doesn't line up that great. So we were typically have started these agreements just right before the holiday break here where everybody goes away. So we worried about, you know, would we be able to promote this uh, quickly enough and so on. And it's just surprisingly, you know, we already had faculty who were asking about this before the agreements were finalized. Um, I think our office of research here has been pretty good at, at promoting this kind of stuff. There's a lot of discussion on campuses here about the research life cycle and grant funded research. And so the, this really kind of ties into that. And it's actually made the library, given the library much more presence in those discussions about publishing and where do you publish and how do you publish. Yeah, that's great to hear, right? Because sometimes this is a way to have those kinds of conversations with faculty, with students that sometimes can be, you know, less connected to the library sometimes. Um, that's that's an interesting point. Um, well, great. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to, that's my last question for now, but let's, um, thank you for that conversation for this, this discussion. Um, and I'm going to ask for the slides to come back up now. And then we will uh, pass it off to Barat. So what we're gonna do now is you've heard a little bit from both Andy and Kristen about how this works on their campuses and how authors need to be approved by the libraries and so forth. So now I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague Barat who is going to actually show it from the author side, what do authors need to do? So take it away, Barat. Perfect. Thanks Emily and thanks Andy, Kristen for super interesting interview and discussion. Um, and uh, I would like to start by saying thanks for this opportunity to present the author journey to the audience today. So thanks everyone here. So what I'm going to walk you through is the journey of an author who would be eligible for an open access publishing agreement at Elsevier. So we're going to specifically look at uh, the Tulane uh, and Elsevier agreement. So let's make a start. So before we jump into the slides, I would like to walk you through some key definitions because we will use this terminology across the demo for the authors and also the institutional journey, which Matt will walk you through. So let's make a start with uh, the submitting corresponding author. And this is important. So submitting corresponding author is the author who stays in touch with Elsevier in the end-to-end -end journey. And this, this is the author who is who makes the publishing choice on behalf of the author, uh, the author group. And for us, there's one corresponding author per article. And why this is important is this because we would use the submitting corresponding author's affiliation to determine whether the author is eligible for the agreement. We we'll look at that briefly in a second, and then acceptance date, and this is also important. So this is the date the journal accepts the article for publication, and eligibility of our uh, of an author of an article for an agreement is around acceptance date, and then we have Elsevier Open Access Platform, and this is the institutional journey which Matt will walk you through later, and this is where basically Andy and Kristen have been. Uh, using LC Open Access Platform, so call it dashboards uh, because it shows all of the articles that are eligible under the agreement for them to validate. And then last but not least, we have Gold Open Access. And this is a, a term which we use interchangeably for articles, uh, open access articles published in hybrid journals. So hybrid journal offers both open access and subscription option to the author. And there's also Gold Open Access journals that offer gold open access only to the author. It's just a terminology, I think that we use interchangeably in hybrid as well as gold open access journals. Okay, move on to the next slide. And now, uh, just tying to the previous slide, the eligibility criteria. And these are the eligibility criteria we use to determine whether the author is eligible for the agreement. And, here you can see the acceptance date, and that's 
we also looked at that briefly in the last uh, slide and what this needs to what is the importance of this acceptance date is the date it should fall within the agreement period for your institution. So let's say you have an agreement starting January 2024, and that ends in December 2025. The acceptance date of the article should fall within this period for the author to be eligible for the agreement. Then the affiliation. And this is also uh, a, one of the eligibility criteria. So the submitting corresponding author must be affiliated with a participating institution. So the example we're going to look at is from Tulane University. So the submitting corresponding author must be affiliated with Tulane University or one of its departments or faculties to be eligible for publishing. Then we have the journal title. So this every journal, every agreement has a list of journals uh, that are eligible, which is pretty much standard across all our publishing agreements. And uh, the author must have submitted and has gotten an article accepted in a participating journal to be eligible. And you can see on LCR agreements page, which agreements we have and which journals are participating in each of those agreements. It's all publicly available information. Then, Article type, so article type, of course, we offer um, open access for peer reviewed research. All of those article types would be eligible for open access publishing. Okay, so that ends the uh, key uh, information and about the eligibility criteria. So I'm going to walk you through the demo now. So what an author sees when they are eligible for a Tulane University and Elsevier agreement. So if you remember my slides about eligibility criteria, so that's going to play a role in the journey. So let's make a start with uh, author acceptance. So what you're going to see now is a journey that comes after acceptance of the article. So in other words, the article has already gone through the peer review process, the journal has art accepted the article for publication. And at this stage, the author uh, is uh, asked to complete the post acceptance author journey. And the, the screen that you're seeing on my screen at the moment is the link. It, it's, it's basically where the author comes to, to complete the rights and access form. And they, they are presented with the open access publishing options and also subscription publishing option. So this link, is sent to the corresponding author of the article. And you can see this, I've blurred it for obvious reasons here. So this is unique to that particular article, this article title, there's corresponding author information, email address, all of those details. And there's a call to action clear that is complete the rights and access form. So clicking on that will take the author into the first step of the author journey. So you can see at the top, the steps that's involved for the author to complete the author journey. And this author journey is same for all LCR published articles. It's just that we use various uh, eligibility criteria to narrow it down to the authors. So now here, the author is affiliated with a Tulane University and we have an agreement with Tulane University. Uh, so that's what the author has typed in, as you can see. And the author can select um, any of the faculties or departments under Tulane University. So we would match them to the highest level. So we've already collected all of these details at submission. So we're going to pre-populate this information into the post acceptance journey. And then co-author, uh, this is not very relevant for agreement eligibility. And then I've just gone with a, uh, a co-author that, that is based in Belgium, just to show you that difference. What matters for an open access agreement is the corresponding author's affiliation. They can add multiple co-authors and then it's not like the author has to do it every time. Uh, they've provided all of these details uh, at submission. So we auto-populate all of these details into the post acceptance journey. They have an opportunity to make changes or add more co-authors if that is required. Then we move on to research funders. Uh, this is an optional question. So we ask the author, did, you, did the research in your article receive funding? Yes or no. Uh, they can skip this question. If they've received funding, they can define the funder 
and the grant number information. They can also add multiple funders. Maybe that's based on the co-authors. Uh, it's up to the author. Again, this is something we pre-populate from submission as well. And when Matt shows you the institutional journey, this, this is something the, uh, the institutions or the administrators of the institutions would use to determine the eligibility of the author. So we've got all of the details now. So now we would present personalized publishing options to the author. And this is one of the important screens in the author journey, effectively where the author makes the publishing choice. And we know this particular author is affiliated with Tulane University. So they are eligible for an open access agreement with Elsevier. And in this case, you can see two options. You see gold open access and subscription uh, because this is a hybrid journal that offers both the options to the author. And for gold open access, there is an agreement in place that covers the article publishing charge. So on the right hand side, you can see the price box. So the price box starts with the list price of the article for open access. And there is institutional agreement discount that covers 100% of the APC. And to pay on validation, zero. So this is a way to communicate the value of the agreement to the author. And on the left-hand side, we keep the text as minimum as possible to keep it author-friendly and crisp. So I would go with the open access option. And then the rest of the uh, st steps you can see at the top as well. So we are asking the author to make a selection on the license, it's two standard licenses LCR offers. Uh, they go, go, go with the CCBY license in this case, and then come to the rights page. So this is again, standard copyrights page across all of the LCR published articles. And in this case, I've gone with the uh, standard selections. Then we move on to publishing agreement. Uh, here we've got the, uh, again, standard text. Uh, there's small variations depending on the license the author selects and the publishing model. So what the author needs to do is just go through the publishing agreement and agree to the terms of the license agreement. Then doing that will take them to the almost last page of the author journey where we would uh, show a summary of all of the choices the corresponding author has made on behalf of the author group. So there is a funder information, the publishing options, uh, the license the author has selected. And then there's also the price box that continues to show the value of the agreement to the author. So clicking on finish will complete the post acceptance author journey. Uh, and what we would do is, uh, you can see the narration as well on the left-hand side. Once they click on finish, uh, the authors receive a communication uh, that they are publishing under the uh, agreement. And this screen is sent to the entire author group. And we publish the article as open access uh, within 24 hours. So in other words, we don't wait for validation. We publish the article in good faith uh, because the author has selected open access and the administrator then uh, would receive the request for validation within 48 hours. And, and for example, Andy and Christine would have then three weeks to determine the eligibility of the author. If they approve the request, uh, then the author will receive full article publishing charge coverage. If you reject the request, because this is a hybrid journal, then the author has a choice to pay it themselves or through a different fund, or they could publish subscription free of charge. So that pretty much ends the author journey. So I will hand it over to uh, Matt for the institutional journey now. Fantastic, thanks Bharat. And indeed, so we're going to switch gears now and having seen the author journey end to end, we're now going to dive into the institutional workflow and what I'm going to show you is the journey that um, Andy and Kristen's team undertake to validate requests and also to keep track of their agreement. And it, 
It's very straightforward, in fact, in terms of a workflow. Uh, the librarian logs into our Elsevier open access platform, which looks a bit like this on the, the main screen. And what you can see is you're presented with a set of APCs that you're asked to approve the eligibility for. In this case, just one. And you see the, the kind of main basic information about that APC request that is presented in the initial card. You can see it does start to grow over time, that queue, and you'll as the agreement gets underway, um, those requests being approved or rejected, uh, they move into the separate folders that you can see in the, the filters at the top of the requests box, the pending, pending older, where we ask you to take a look at some of those, uh, those requests that maybe have gone a little bit beyond the initial period. Once they're approved, they move into the approved folder and any rejected move into the rejected folder. Of course, you can take a look at all of them uh, by using the all filter. And um, what some people tell us that they find quite useful is to, to look at the all folder and then use that big generate report button that you see, the big blue button saying generate report, just to download the details and all the metadata that's associated with all of those inbound APC requests. We, we understand that people find it very useful to be able to get access to that data uh, when they need it. But typically what people are doing is coming into this screen and opening up one of these APC requests. And if I click to the next slide, you'll see what happens and what you get to see when you move, go into one of those APC requests. You see the article title. You're able to click and view the article on Science Direct so you can take a look and see how that article has been presented in terms of acknowledgements, etc. You see the institution that the author is claiming affiliation to, obviously their, their name um, and critically their email address. I think we heard from Andy earlier and Kristen, that email address is, is very important in terms of being able to validate eligibility for the deal. So a uh, critical piece of information there. Actually, um, hot off the press, we've also added one additional piece to this, which is the ORCID ID of the author. Not presented here, those uh, screenshots came in uh, a bit too early. But ORCID ID, if the author gives us the ORCID ID during submission, we will present it back in the APC request screen here, also to help with identifying that author as part of the institution. You also see some of the other important metadata about the article, what kind of article, what type it is, the full length article or, or otherwise, what journal, the journal type, what license the author selected in their, uh, the author journey that Barat showed, um, the identifier for that article and the DOI so that you can keep track of that DOI. You also see the grant ID information that the author uh, input during their journey and some of the key dates like accepted and when the author completed their, their uh, workflow. Um, and then, Pretty straightforwardly, the uh, librarian or, or open access administrator will either approve or reject that APC request. And in this case, they're going to click approve. They've left the box ticked that you see there, notify the author. So that will send out an automatic email to the author that congratulations, your APC request has been approved by your institution. And um, that completes the workflow. But in addition to the workflow, our Elsevier Open Access platform is also very useful for keeping track and an overview of how the agreement is going. And we offer um, this reporting functionality that helps everybody keep track of how uptake is going. Uh, there's too much data to present on a single slide, but a couple of key uh, screenshots that you can see um, help, uh, help uh, librarians keep track of things. So the different agreements that are in place. And in the case of uh, consortium style arrangement, you can filter by institute. Um, what kind of publishing model it is, whether it's hybrid or open access, the start and end dates, so you can filter down to that and what the status is. But overall you see, you know, in this case, we've had 99 articles in total that would, would have been eligible for the agreement. 
we've had 58 have been accepted, one was rejected, and three are working their way and not yet uh, come into the platform because the author hasn't quite completed their journey yet. And then 37 articles are remaining uh, in the subscription model. So it's a really good way of keeping track of uptake of the agreement. And obviously we're very keen to work together uh, with our customers on that. And then the, another simple example, you can see uh, similar data, but presented in a monthly fashion visually. So you can see how things are progressing month to month through the course of the agreement. And I think um, that's really the, the workflow. And uh, as um, uh, Bharat uh, showed, you know, we continue to enhance and continue to invest in these products and these workflows to, to uh, respond to the feedback that we get from, from our customers. And we really try and make it them as good as possible and easy as possible to use. So we have some uh, additional information and some resources that are available through uh, through our websites. And um, these will be in the slides when they are distributed. But I think that finishes our, our demo. And let me hand back to Emily to take some questions. Great. Thank you so much to all of you, to Andy and Kristen and Bharat and Matt. What a what a great session and, and so informative. I really learned a lot um, working with all of you and, and putting this together. So thank you. Thank you for all of your hard work. Um, so yes, at this point, we have about 15 minutes left for um, audience Q&A. We, we do have some folks who've already put their questions into the Q&A. So I encourage you, if you have any questions for any of us, please do put them into the Q&A um, functionality there. Um, and uh, also, if you have additional questions or want to contact any of us directly after the session, please feel free to do so. And we have put our email addresses up on this last slide. Um, and the slides and recording will be uh, shared on the ACRL Choice website. So you will be able to go back to them and, and click on these links and, and see our emails and so forth. Um, so yes, so uh, let's uh, let's go into the Q&A and get started. We've got a bunch of them here. Um, so first question uh, from Hillary, and this is, I believe, to um, really to uh, to Andy and Kristen. And Hillary writes, do you all have agreements with other OA publishers or was Elsevier your top priority with establishing an OA agreement? So a little question there about how many other agreements you have. Um, I don't know um, who wants I to take go. that. Okay. I can go first. Andy. Elsevier was probably one of our I don't know, maybe our third agreement, third or fourth. So we have currently, we have an agreement, an OA agreement with Elsevier. We have one with Wiley, we have one with Cambridge University Press, uh, American Chemical Society was one of the early ones. And then we have some small, some agreements with some small publishers. And then we have two that we're about to, once again, it's December, <laughs> the end of the calendar year, we have two new ones that we're about to roll out. One that's not quite an agreement that's not quite completed, but the other one is our first consortial agreement. It's a, it's uh, and that one is an arrangement that Lyricist has worked out with Springer, and so we're ac anxious to find out the the details of that very soon so we can get that info out to our faculty before the holiday break. How, how about it, Kansas, Kristen? So um, it, it was largely related to timing and what was being offered. So we already had a sort of an agreement in place with Taylor and Francis. It was really just a deposit account. Um, for us to approve um, our authors. So not really a traditional read and publish type agreement. Um, we've also had um, some agreements with publishers such as PLOS um, around the time that uh, KU completed the Elsevier agreement, KU Lawrence completed an agreement with Cambridge. Um, that is not 
med authors are not eligible for that agreement. So it's, it's a Lawrence only. Um, and I am going to post. So both of our OA initiatives pages are in the chat now, and you can see ones that are limited to med and um, Lawrence, of course, they have more funds than the medical campus does. So they have more agreements um, available. Uh, one thing that I, We've we've attempted to negotiate with um, Wiley, Springer Nature, Sage, and Taylor and Francis. Um, we had unbundled many of those packages, and it seems the trend is that they want um, they want us back in the big deals, and that is not something that we're budgetarily able to do. So that really precludes us from being able to participate in some of these uh, read and publish deals. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, yeah, a whole bunch of questions in here. Um, let's see. Um, we have a question here from Rhonda. If the license agreement, and I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand this. So if the license agreement is not completed by a given date, are you able to go back and retroactively make articles OA through the agreement once all the formal paperwork is completed and your OA workflow is active? So I think this is a question about you know, somebody submitted an article before the agreement was signed and you want to make it retroactively open. So um, anyone want to want to jump in on this one? So I think this is a response to um, me mentioning that we had to expedite the license agreement to have it completed by early January. Um, I will say, I don't know if you're not able to complete it until let's say March, if you can retrospectively from January to March, um, flip those articles to OA, I think that would be a question for Baroth. Yes, thanks uh, Christian. So I think it depends on the agreement itself. Uh, usually we have, like Christian said, we usually we have agreements that are being signed right before the start date so we can uh, help the authors. There are some cases, of course, uh, depending on the agreement and what's agreed that we could retrospectively offer uh, the uh, open access option to the authors under the agreement. Uh, so I think that's, if that is the case, I would suggest discussing that with Elsevier, of course, uh, uh, if you have any plans of having an agreement. And then we can certainly come back to you with the answers specifically for that agreement. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question for you, Matt, I think. Um, Josh writes, is Elsevier researching author motivations to choose subscription access when they can freely publish openly? Is that misunderstanding, confusion, principled stance? So I think this is about that screen that Barat showed in the, yeah. in the um, author workflow, right? Where you can choose subscription. Yes, indeed. And, and I, I'd probably ask uh, Barat to comment as well. But yes, we, we definitely do try and understand the author motivation. Um, you know, we, we are trying to drive uptake of the publishing agreements, the open access publishing agreements as much as we possibly can. And actually over time, we've honed the wording that we present to the author to try and make it as straightforward and simple as possible. And we do survey the authors very regularly to, to get their feedback about, you know, what are they seeing? Is there something they don't quite understand? And we try and make uh, small incremental improvements to, to try and drive that. Um, I think what remains, it there is still a, a, a some misunderstanding um, in the author community. And we definitely, you know, are, are trying to work together to, to iron that out. Um, but yeah, we do see it's mostly misunderstanding that uh, that people choose subscription at this point. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, th another question here. Um, this one's from Rhonda. How do we know our institution's eligib eligibility date for publication? I think I think depends. that's a Barack question. Yeah. So indeed. So Rhonda, I don't know if you 
already have an agreement with Elsevier. So the institution eligibility date would only come into picture if there's an agreement with Elsevier. So let's say your institution has a an agreement starting 1st January 2023. That would be your eligibility date for the agreement in place. But for the authors, they can publish it any time in any time in uh, any time basically. Does that answer your question? I think that makes sense. Yes. Um, great. Um, and then let's see. Uh, here's a great question from Julia. Um, I'm curious about the library having or hanging on to the publishing role with authors instead of a university office of research wanting to handle it. So this is the approval, you know, um, verification of the author. Why does the library do it? instead of the Office of Research. And she says, is there an internal turf issue to consider in regard to author publishing support? And I don't know, I'm gonna throw this over to our librarians first. Was that ever a consideration? Like, should the library do this or should the um, Office of Research do this? And so, Andy, do you wanna take that one? Um, <clears throat> yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that, um... It's a turf issue so much, and and actually, from my from my perspective, yeah, I think that's an interesting idea. I mean, handing this off to the Office of Research at some point, if they have the stat, you know, <laughs> we have we have plenty to do here uh, um, on our own. If somebody else at the Office of Research is willing to take this on, I I might want to have that discussion. Um, but it, it's it's no it, it's it's not that much of a tourist thing. I, I think it became part of the library just because that's where the subscriptions originate, and that's it's the library that negotiates the agreement and the license. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think it also probably varies a lot institution by institution, library by library, right? Different countries yeah. do different things. Um, so we have a question here from um, Laxman uh, asking if we could say something about Plan S and and that implementation. And so Plan S is a program in Europe uh, which supports open access. Um, so Matt or Barath, have you been involved in any institutions that are uh, signatory to Plan S? And what did those implementations look like for, for these platforms? Is, was there any difference? Anything you want to say to comment on those, those European agreements? Yes, I can comment a bit on Plan S uh, implementation. So we have, uh, there's a, and a coalition S, there is a group of funders uh, who would uh, allow publishing open access who would cover article publishing charges for articles published in open access journals and transformative journals. And for open access journals are the list of titles where open access is the option. The authors can only publish open access and these funders would pay article publishing charges by default. And uh, we also have some transformative journals. So transformative journals are hybrid journals that uh, will eventually move to open access publishing model completely in, in the coming years. And uh, the plan S or coalition S funders would also cover the article publishing charges for authors funded by, by them. Um, and that's what I can uh, comment on. Um, and of course, there's also a coalition S website, which I, I'll share the link with you. And these policies uh, keep changing on a regular basis. And Elsevier generally works with coalition S group to make a change as that is required as well. Thank you, Vera. And we are just about at time. I realize we didn't get through all of your questions. I want to thank the audience for such great questions um, and, and such a wide um such a wide range of questions too, which is really wonderful to see. So thank you for that. Um, feel free to follow up with any of us afterwards, uh, as I mentioned before. And Sabrina, I'm going to pass it back to you to uh, to close us out. So, so once again, thank you to everyone. Sure, great. Thanks, Emily. Uh, yeah, I'll just 
echo Emily and say thanks so much to Barat, Andy, Matt, Kristen, and Emily for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you to our attendees for your questions and comments. I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording, as well as where to access today's slides. Also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we would really appreciate it. So thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you learned something new from the session and hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.